peace, the kingdom of God is at hand. I want to speak to you about the deadly consequences of complaining. Give you some examples to help you realize how serious this sin truly is and how we are to break the strongholds of demons who only aim to destroy God's children. Satan does this with thoughts that he whispers into the minds of people. Remember, he is called the Prince of the Power of the Air, as in Ephesians 2, 2, Paul says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the Prince of the Power of the Air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together in Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. All throughout the Bible, Satan is called the devil, the tempter, the accuser, and the father of lies. These lies, temptations, and condemnation all begin as thoughts in our minds. Jesus called Satan a murderer in John 8:44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan lies to us every day trying to implant doubt, fears, anxieties in our thoughts. Have you ever found yourself thinking of something negative suddenly, like one of those what-if moments that just pop into your mind, and you find yourself actually envisioning a scenario that seemed to appear out of the blue in your thoughts. To give you an example, I was looking about the living room, thinking about straightening some pictures that hung on the wall, when suddenly I noticed how narrow the doorway to the foyer was, and the thought came to me, how would an EMT get me on a gurney out of this place? I began to picture the difficulty of conjured efforts to move me in an emergency situation through the hallway, out the door, beyond the gates, when suddenly, shockingly, the Holy Spirit interrupted me like a jolt. What are you doing? Jesus asked. Stop. And the evil scene playing like a film in my mind vanished. I was actually mentally entertaining an idea that the devil had put into my mind just cast it like a stone into my happy thoughts, disrupting my focus with some evil scenario, and without realizing it, I was distracted by the enemy. The Bible says, Bring every thought and imagination to the obedience of Christ, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5 Wow, do you understand why it's so important that we do this? Jesus Christ healed me, and such a scenario was evil for me to even entertain. And Jesus tells us, be anxious for nothing, to focus on Him, on blessings. Do you see how the lying prince of the errors works to tempt us into speaking the wrong way, to thinking the wrong way? If the Holy Spirit hadn't corrected me, I might have went on to tell my husband to make certain there was an alternate route to that miserable mirage of malevolence. Then what? My words would have been speaking against the will of God, against the truth, and giving space to Satan, which is what we are not supposed to do. You know that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against the principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. In Revelation 12, 9 through 11, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, 
and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ, and the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. You see, not only does Satan accuse us whenever we speak that which is not our Father's will, but he also accuses us like a tattler to God whenever we make mistakes, such as behaving according to the temptations he puts before us. And sometimes that is a way of using others to suggest horrible things to us. It could be as simple as someone telling you, Hey, you look terrible. What's going on with you? And immediately you begin to think, gosh, what's wrong with me? And start speaking worries, stresses, anxieties, or blaming others for this sudden awfulness that someone suggested to you. All the while, you are speaking precisely what gives the devil entrance into your life. Because none of those things you speak are the truth. That's how cunning the enemy is. Remember Peter trying to dissuade the Lord from going to Jerusalem where he would be killed when he said to Jesus, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And our Lord responded, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. That's in Matthew 16.23. See how Satan was tempting Peter to speak against God's plan? His will for Jesus to abandon the mission that God had given him to fulfill. By saying that, get thee behind me, Satan, Jesus was essentially telling Peter to stop being a hindrance to God's plan. The enemy will try to tempt you with images and scenarios in your imagination, as well as using others, especially those close to you, to try to infiltrate your thoughts with sins, worries, and doubts, etc., when I was diagnosed in 2016 with what men call stage 4 lung cancer, which spread to my brain, I referred to the diagnosis as what it was, pestilence. My daughter at the time, being a nurse, one day said to me, Mom, tell me. Tell me what it is you have. I want to make sure that you're not in denial. You see, because I wasn't depressed and down and all bummed out. <laughs> She wanted me to tell her what the diagnosis and the prognosis was. And see, what she didn't like was that I never referred to it as anything else other than a demonic attack. I didn't say what the medical men conjured, calling it cancer. Rather, I spoke the truth according to Christ. And I told her, the doctors say it's cancer, but it's pestilence, sweetie. A demon that has no place in me, for I am healed. And this I proclaimed from the onslaught. I'm trying to show you how the enemy works and how extremely important it is that you walk and talk in the Spirit according to God's words. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. John 1, 1 through 2 and 14. We must keep a constant vigilance as it is written in 1 Peter 5, 8, being sober and vigilant because our adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Remember, Satan is referred to as the prince of the air, which means our minds, our thoughts are his playground. And Jesus tells us to resist Satan and he will flee. He tried to tempt Jesus by quoting scripture and saying unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest ye dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. See how he tried to cast doubt, saying, If thou be the Son of God? and then trying to get him to jump off a cliff to commit suicide? How many times has doubt entered your mind? Have you pondered scriptures and thought, I prayed that, and it still hasn't happened, or it's not for me, or thought of yourself as not good enough, not righteous enough, etc., etc., etc.? 
How many times have you had suicidal thoughts, all of which are notions that come from the enemy, Satan? Why? How is this so? Well, is it God's will for you to destroy yourself after he sent his son to die, paying the penalty for your sins? Of course not. Is it God who wants you to feel like nothing, like no one, although you've been born again and adopted by him and translated into the kingdom of his dear son? You who've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you who are seated beside the Lord in heavenly places, do you think all of that is God's will for you? All of that negative, evil, wicked stuff? that just plays in your mind like some wretched loop? Of course not. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This speaks of the great privilege and honor that we believers have being united with Christ. And it also emphasizes the hope and confidence we have in our ultimate destiny with him. Ephesians 1, 13-14 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. 1 John two twenty seven. But you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives in you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what he teaches you is true. It is not a lie. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. We must keep our eyes on Jesus no matter what at all times. Speaking to him praying with them, worshiping, praising, just being with them, trusting in him alone. Christ was tempted by the enemy, and he did not sin. He went to the cross, submitting himself to God's will without protest, without complaining, without sin. We too must learn to submit ourselves to God through Christ Jesus in all forms of life, hold fast to the truth, Jesus warned us, and he warned his disciples, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. Know these things. Read your Bible. Know our Heavenly Father's words and will for your life, and expect tribulations with confidence that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now you know what to expect and how to speak, just as our Lord did when he was approached by the devil, the evil one. Speak the word of God. Above all, do not fear. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Not some, all the power of the enemy. And nothing, nothing by any means shall hurt you. Luke ten nineteen. Wow, nothing by any means shall hurt you. Think about that for a moment. Nothing by any means shall hurt you. So when you get some kind of crazy imagination or thought or something horrible happening, just remember that. Speak that out loud. It is written, nothing by any means shall harm me. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And the keys of hell and death I have. That is Revelation one eighteen. Ultimately, it is Jesus who decides who enters these realms, knowing that he has laid his life down for you, taking your punishment that you are redeemed from the curse of the law of sin and death. Why would you fear anything when you know the Lord loves you? The only one you should fear is God, who has the power to cast you into hell. Jesus says, And fear not them that which can kill the body, 
but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are you hearing? Are you listening? Let that sink in. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1 7. You know, in 2019, when the Lord told me to leave the treatments at the cancer center, that I didn't belong there, I was elated. That very week, I sat talking to my husband in the living room about how the Holy Spirit was moving in me, speaking to me, quickening me. Suddenly, a picture of the Last Supper flew off the wall. It was a huge portrait of the Lord and His disciples encased in glass. It crashed down and made a huge boom, and my husband's eyes stretched wide, and I knew immediately the enemy was angry. I cast the demon out of our home and the pitcher did not break. The glass wasn't shattered. Praise the Lord. A few months after the scan showed no evidence of any pestilence, I had a seizure and woke up in the hospital. What's going on? I asked the Lord, and he told me, it's all lies, that he had healed me. I asked him if he was coming to get us, and he said yes, very soon. Then the Lord gave me a dream, showing me it was Satan trying to steal me out of this world. And then the Lord gave me another dream. I was walking in a place that looked like a cave. I could see a Persian prince standing with a long scimitar, stabbing at three men on the floor. They were writhing, screaming, crying out. And while he shoved his sword into them, I just walked closer and closer. He was shoving the sword into the back of one, the belly of another, and stabbing the back of the head of another man. It was gruesome because they were not dying, only suffering and taking this really violent, vicious attack. I looked past them, and past them there were thousands of naked people being tortured by more of these princes who wore these turbans on their head. None of these people were dying, only wailing, and suddenly the one nearest me stopped stabbing one of the three and looked up at me. He motioned his sword as if to say, lay down, to indicate that I was next. I looked at him up and down, and I said, you can't touch me. I'm anointed. He shrugged and went back to hacking on the men on the ground. I turned, looked away, and walked slowly out from them into the world, a world that was perishing. The skies were red, there was smoke everywhere and there were these huge black birds i mean as tall as the eiffel tower if not taller and they were walking and they were looking around and their heads were just turning from one side to the other and i knew they were looking for flesh just to feast on and the whole ground was trembling and all of a sudden i could hear someone yelling the king of capernaum wants you and i woke straight up out of bed sitting up and I was writhing in pain, and I suddenly started speaking in the spirit. And once I did, the spirit of pain fled. Oh my gosh, I was so happy and so filled with joy and gratitude. The Lord had showed me. He showed me what to say, and he showed me how to behave. I knew from that moment on how to deal with the enemy, which is fearlessly. To this day, whenever I feel anything evil trying to attack me, I speak precisely what God showed me to speak, as well as behaving fearless. In the Spirit, I speak, Father, I claim the blood of the Holy Lamb, Jesus Christ. And then aloud at the enemies, vigilant and present, I am anointed, and no evil can come nigh me. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Revelation twelve eleven. Knowing your identity in Christ Jesus and that you have authority over all the power of darkness is the prerequisite to living for the Lord. You must also remain obedient to God's commands, for it is in this manner in which you show your love for God, for the Lord. Demons know who you are and to whom you belong. 
and whether you will stand in the test or fail, so very much has to do with what you speak. The book of Job recounts him saying, Teach me, and I will be quiet. Show me where I have been wrong. And Job was a good man, but he feared much for his children and lost everything. He did never curse God, only wept. And if anyone had reason to weep, you'd think it'd be Job. He lost everything. And God said to Job, Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare unto me. Gird up your loins like a man, right? He wasn't patting his back and telling him, Oh, don't cry, it's going to be okay. Gird up your loins like a man. And many complain of much that is trite in comparison. I tell you, do not complain, do not grumble, do not argue. Be thankful for all God has given you and pray for others. Declare yourself blessed, healed, for this honors our Heavenly Father and the blood that was spilled for you by Jesus Christ. Resist the devil with the word of the Almighty and he will flee. Walk and talk and worship God in the Spirit and keep the faith, for the time is drawing nigh that our redemption is near. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you are able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girded with the truth and the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereto unto all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. For in this manner you will be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, resisting temptation, overcoming spiritual attacks, and remaining firm in faith. God bless each and every one of you in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.